<laughs> hey, great. Good afternoon, you guys. And uh, thank you very much for coming to our great event and registering for this great session. Hope you'll enjoy it. Where's enthusiasm? Yay! Yay! Oh! CDM rules. <laughs> yes, uh, a short intro and then little housekeeping. I'm, uh, hi, I'm Oleg. I won't bother you with my last name. That's uh, important. I'm a program manager on the team that works for Maryland CDM, and this yeah. is... I'm Robert Bruckner, architect on the Common Data Model. So I actually makes it happen, and I just talk about it. <laughs> so a uh, little housekeeping. We have a session starting at 2.15, which is a very short window between the end of this one and when we need to switch rooms, and some of you uh, will sw be switching rooms too. So I'll try to manage time very closely and uh, have a very kind of a tight Q&A at the end, so don't be surprised when I start to do times up, okay? Great, so uh, common data model, all you need to know. So this is a short agenda, this is, gives you kind of a context of what we are going to talk about today. And uh, what is the most important part that we want you to take off from this session is that what is the problem, what is the motivation for us to uh, start the CDM and what is CDM actually helpful for you to solve your problems and to start with that What do you think that is your world changing or it's static so the the problems that you solve with data? I think it's pretty uh, rapidly changing and the companies uh, start to view data not as just means to an end but actually an asset that you can employ and derive great value from so when we say unlocking your data challenge, what does it really mean? Is data is always, and you live it every day, all day, uh, data is all locked in a different schemas, in different metadata, it's a different relationships. It's very heterogeneous. If you want to analyze data to make sense out of your data, it's very difficult because with data all being represented in different formats and with different metadata, there is a huge effort on the prep to prep the data to do any analysis of it, let alone let machine do an analysis. So you always need to have human interaction there and it, that may lead to inefficiencies and it's hard to collaborate. And lastly, with all the recent advances in uh, analytics and machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, it becomes very consuming for an individual to interact with the model, train the model, if it needs the human to interpret your data. That's kind of the context for the world is changing, the data challenge is becoming bigger, and how do we actually view this problem? And the customer experience these days is changing dramatically as well. You have customer data coming from all sources, not only your traditional uh, transaction systems or the CRM systems or the uh, ERP and LOB, but it's coming from the web, it's coming from a mobile devices, it's coming from social, it's coming from IoT, advertising, transactions, and all these data is modeled differently, it has different format is being kept at, and it has very different semantics. So not even the same thing doesn't mean the same thing when you look at the different data sources and different applications. So what are we gonna do about it? First off, this is what your world looks like today. These are all your data from a previous slide locked in different silos because all data is being produced and managed in different stacks. And when you want to bring it together to do some analysis or derive some uh, ca the customer analytics, figure out what are your customers are more likely to buy or what do you want to uh, instruct your supply chain to replenish, for example. Give you a very simple visceral example. Paper towels dispensers. How often do you come up to this great machine, wave your hand, nothing happens? But it's an electronic, there's a chip in there, so if it emits IoT data in uh, the near real time process, the, the people who are supposed to replenish it will know what to do, so you won't be stuck there just hitting the, that box hoping that something works. And this is a very simple, I didn't want to give you the glamorous examples of like flying, uh, to the moon, it's very visceral. It's very related to your customers. On the how the customer, how do you know what the customer is more likely to buy so you can target your work there. And with our approach is what, and this is where the CDM starts to come in, how do we help you harmonize 
and semantically harmonized, most importantly, the data that comes out of all these heterogeneous data sources. So you don't have this picture, but you have this picture, when all your data is interoperable, when you can understand that the customer means the customer across all your systems, and the device means the device across all your systems. So you have a metadata that is shared that is machine readable. By machine readable, I mean that the computer can understand it, not only human, and it has rich semantics. So it's not just distance, but it's actually a distance between cities. So it's not just a city string with a name, but it's a location. And here comes the common data model. Short, CDM, so you all heard about it. How many of you heard of CDM? Oh, I, I kind of don't count. Yes, that, that, that's great. That, that's a great thing. It's very good to see. So what is CDM in short? And I'm going to go fairly brief about it and then transition into Robert, so we're going to go into the details. It's not a server. It's not something you install on, your, uh, on top of your ERP system. It's a shared data model that allows applications and data to interoperate and have a unified definition of data. So it's again, it's the metadata that describes the data. Think of it as a language. CDMs includes rich metadata system that has standard entities, captures entities, relationships between entities, hierarchies, traits. What do you think the trait is? So it's not a phone number. Is emergency phone number or is uh, business contact phone number. So think of it as adjectives. So it gives you richer semantics into all the things that CDM captures. And if you have a list of standard traits and you can train your uh, machinery to understand the traits, you don't have to get involved. So CDM allows you to capture that. Where the origin of CDM is, it originated from our Dynamics 365 apps. It's currently it's open source, it, uh, open sourced. And we have an ecosystem of partners that look at it and uh, actually do the industry-specific definitions of CDM, and we're going to talk about it later in the presentation today. And uh, there are multiple platforms and multiple services that are CDM-aware already uh, this day, and our plan is to have more and more services out of the box be CDM-aware and provide you this rich functionality with shared and commonly understood metadata. Excited so far? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Jeff, you don't count. You're excited. By... Okay, great. So we're going to transition over into All right. So through the session, we will walk you through different aspects of how the common data model is in use today, how it writes surfaces already across multiple different products, including also how we're extending it. And so one of the areas that was mentioned already is extending it also in, um, in collaboration with industry partners. And so this is what we call the industry accelerators. We have already released a few of them, but here are the general principles before we go into some of the details. Um, this is really about, right, for particular industries, uh, building on ultimately an open, open standards when possible, um, or by defining basically aspects of data models that are commonly used in certain scenarios for those particular industries, um, building out also applications, so not just the data model itself, the data model is kind of a means to an end to provide right, certain end-to-end uh, -end business processes, uh, let's say in healthcare around patient care management, or in nonprofit uh, about volunteer management. Now, some of these aspects, patient care management, volunteer management, have things in them that are related to right, how you think of a relationship management, um, right, be it, for example, customer relationship management. But there's very unique aspects to right, being a patient um, and patient care management and managing the relationship with practitioners and so on, or doing volunteer management around nonprofits. So that means we are basically extending uh, that data model to account for these things, but building it around a common base. And by building it around that common base, what it allows is the, all the ecosystem of applications that already exists around relationship management, for example, to basically interact with that data that is then ultimately right through, let's say, patient care management brought into the system to basically further extend it. Um, now, those accelerators that, that we are building in conjunction with, with partners 
they are available for free. You can actually find them on uh, App Source. You can install them into your particular common data service and Dynamics environments. Um, they come with uh, particular right, UI areas, business logic, and data models. Um, and so in terms of what is available today, there is uh, three of them available, and some of them are already right on the second version, so we also keep improving, iterating them. Um, so on healthcare, nonprofit, and higher education, we have in preview right now automotive, and then two sub areas of the financial services area about commercial banking and retail banking. Um, and so if you think of it, right, so this is basically the current ecosystem of partners that have already built or are in progress of building solutions that build on top of the accelerator, that builds on top of the core uh, common data model. And so what this means is, from a customer perspective, that as they um, adopt a particular solution by one of the partners, those solutions interoperate with other, basically, solutions in the ecosystem because they share a common data model. Um, and they can be easily extended using then the common data service, which is one of the platforms that implements the common data model, um, as well as power apps. Um, similarly, right, you can go from the common data service and build analytics um, directly over these particular extensions. And I will show an example in a moment, um, just switching. And so if we look at the Okay, just a second. Okay. So if we look at this page for the, no, for the nonprofit accelerator, what you see is that it really covers um, a range of different scenarios just out of the box. That is the accelerator that uh, is provided by Microsoft, and then partners build further solutions on top of this. And so you, you see in this particular case for the nonprofit accelerator, um, right, constituents, uh, fundraising, awards, all those activities that are covered, you see there's a whole list of ultimately entities extensions that are being defined here. And then as part of the accelerator, you actually get out of the box um, UI experiences that basically build on, on top of that data model. So it's not just the raw data model, you actually get ultimately use experiences automatically out of the box, including uh, BI experiences. Now, how are these BI experiences built? They ultimately key off the particular uh, entities that are defined in this particular data model. So when it comes to volunteer management and the extensions for it, um, there's basically BI solutions, and there's an example of it that is also providing the accelerator that is specifically targeting those new entities. What this also means now for, for customers, from a customer perspective, they have a choice of multiple solutions that cover different aspects. In this case, let's say of the nonprofit vertical. Um, there's also solutions that are specifically covering the BI, the business intelligence aspect, because right, you may have, you may want to see just higher level insights into your volunteers, right, and kind of management or into your fundraising. Um, and then you have right, the specific activities where you interact with volunteers one-on-one, -on -one, which you track right, uh, basically directly and maybe different people that right, have those interactions. So you have the analytic side, you have the more the transactional side of it. Um, and the, the accelerators ultimately cover all of those areas. Now there's other examples right, for healthcare and higher education, but ultimately um, this is one way of how we extending uh, the common data model through basically for specific industry extensions, aside from the things that we are doing just um, as part of the Microsoft application platform where we have right, entities for sales, service, marketing, uh, field service, customer support, um, project automation services, and we bring more and more of the finance and operations side also into the, the common data model over time. And so how does this look like underneath? And so I will just quickly show um, right, how to think of this. There is the common data service, which implements the common data model, and I will show an example of this in a moment. You have a set of applications that are available out of the box for the common data service. You can install, right, there's a marketplace of additional applications. You can also build your own applications using Power Apps, um, which is really a no-code development uh, for mobile and web applications. And there are sessions at this conference that will give you, right, great, insights and, and demos of how you can you build right, your own power app very quickly. Um, now, the common data service is ultimately right, covering 
ultimately providing a storage layer, a managed storage layer. So you don't have to um, work with right, low level concepts like a database, but you can work with higher level concepts where you basically just visually define the entities or you bring applications into that environment and the applications bring the particular entities that they have dependency on. Um, now when it comes to uh, high scale analytics, there's basically a pattern here where we also want to make it easy to analyze that data. Um, and so we'll cover in the rest of the session Power BI as well as um, Azure Data Services and how they come into this picture. But at the highest level, think of it as we have data integration experiences of how you can bring data from external sources into the common data service. Um, there's experiences of how you can also bring data from the common data service into the analytical world. Um, and so you may have tried some of these already. And then there's also a new experience that we ultimately are working towards, which automatically will bring all the inserts, updates, deletes that happen as part of applications um, on top of the common data service automatically into the data lake, into your data lake, and you don't have to worry about right, operationalizing this. We will do it out of the box. And I'll show briefly uh, that part as well. And so with that, I want to just quickly show um, right, so if you go to the, to the Power Apps Maker portal, this is also where you can manage certain aspects of your common data service. And so here, if I look at the data tab, this is just basically a trial environment that you can spin up on your own, um, right, and it comes with certain entities out of the box, um, and by the number of, the, of them are standard here, so so-called standard entities defined in the common data model with well-defined semantics. You can, of course, create your own custom entities. You can extend standard entities. You can do all of that here in a graphical way. Um, now, if I switch to UI experiences here, right, let's say I have my account list about my B2B uh, contacts that I want to sell to. There's a certain right, UI experience that is available. Um, I can right, ultimately do editing operations, let's say, for the Alpine Ski House um, account, there's certain details right to this account. Now, this particular UI is extensible, but it has a certain structure out of the box. Now, with, the, with Power Apps being an application platform, you can actually extend those, those UIs either directly or you can build an application that is basically separate but operates over the same data. And so an example of this is Right, so this is kind of the built-in UI. Um, I'll show a quick example of an app that I built just within a few minutes. This may be kind of the worst power app you have ever seen, so I'm, I'm not really proud of this. <laughs> I just quickly put this together, but this was just in a few seconds, um, and ultimately, right, you can deploy this into that environment, and it reads the same data that basically the Dynamics application sees, or that right, a partner application that installs into that same environment can also operate over. So if I make a change, um, let's say in this particular list here, right, I have the Alpine Ski House and maybe the number of employees right, was incorrect, so I'm updating this to let's say 5,000 um, and I save this ultimately. And if I go back to my running instance of the Power App, and in this case I just hit the refresh button, it will ultimately, you can see, right, that it basically, the update is reflected here. But the same way with Power, App, Power Apps, it's basically an application framework that easily allows you to build applications from data. And so in this case, this is auto-generated layout, um, but it basically also allows editing, right? So I can go in here, and I can ultimately, right, change it here as well. And I say 5,500. And I basically commit that change. And so at that point, Right, if I go back here and I hit the refresh, um, right, basically I see the same data ultimately across different applications. Some of them are built in, out of the box. Some of them, right, you may have built as a power app. Some of them come by partners. And ultimately, you can build those applications specifically bound to some of these standard entities. And this is how it helps you in that kind of ecosystem when it comes to, let's say, the more transactional side. But the same thing can be done with Power BI. And I will come back to that point in a few minutes. What I want to show is, right, so we have now all this data in the common data service, kind of the left-hand side of the picture. 
And we want to enable this for analytics. And so one of the new experiences that we are enabling, and there's a session that is marked at the bottom um, that you can, you can attend later today um, that goes into details um, that basically how to enable that data to flow automatically into the data lake and then use it for analytical consumption. So, and just, I'll just quickly walk through, right? What you see in that UI experience that I just was in, in that maker portal, there's, there's a new tab that basically allows you to link your data lake to a particular CDS environment. And so all you have to do at that point is, you simply sign in, um, in this case where I signed in as myself, and then I select the particular entities that I want to just automatically be kept up to date in the data lake. And once I do this, this experience will automatically configure all the necessary things underneath, the whole infrastructure, to basically land the data in a storage account um, and keep it up to date continuously, right? So you don't have to worry about, okay, how do you schedule any of this? It just happens automatically. And you can ultimately, right, then build analytical consumption, right? Here's a quick, simple example of, okay, connecting Power BI to that data. Now, what gets really interesting is, if, right, this is not just connecting to your custom entities that you may have defined in the common data service, but it's really about, okay, were, if you build applications that are specifically tied to some of the standard entities um, that may exist. And so an example of this is, and here I'll show again. Um, so if you look at, this is Dynamics 365 Sales Insights, right? Sales Insights gives you, it's kind of a packaged application that gives you a bunch of pre-built insights into, in this case, the sales pipeline, right? The sales data that you have in that common data service. And for that one, um, what it's basically looking at is things such as, right, opportunities, sales opportunities, um, actual, right, sales deals that have happened. Um, so it, I guess it probably timed out, so it will take a few seconds to, to reload here. So about sales opportunities, then about your sales pipeline, how your sales team is doing. Um, yeah. Let me just refresh. And so, and now that particular sales insights application is specifically built not as a one-off thing, right, where you would go in and would basically say, okay, connect from Power BI to that data, but you can ultimately um, build your BI application such that it looks for specific entities. It looks for, right, your opportunities for your leads. It looks for, right, the particular uh, contacts that you have for B2C or your, for your accounts for B2B. And ultimately, right, you can build out this BI application that is just focused on what is the shape of the data. And then you have your, right, all the different CDS environments that are deployed, right, in your, in your environments, or if you're an ICV and you build, right, extensions to those solutions, um, you can, right, ultimately, as long as you build on top of these extensions, you know that the data out of the common data service lands in the storage in the data lake in a certain format, and the BI application can simply build against that. And so that way you can effectively decouple and build a BI application against a particular shape of data, and it was installable into many different environments. And this is a pattern that is also used in some of these industry accelerators, where we have partners that have right, already right, a rich history of, of building, let's say in the healthcare area, building experiences around patient care management. And, but they were basically had a choice to make where if they wanted to sell to hospitals and so on, and right, the, the ultimately the managers of the hospitals, they wanted to see BI insights over right, all that data, um, right, and all sorts of metrics ultimately that they're interested in. And so those particular ISVs had to have the choice of, okay, they can build right, their own particular data model, and then they have to build their BI experience on top, or they look at how can they build those kind of uh, experiences on top of a more common data model that is more standardized. In the healthcare, we specifically focused on the um, FHIR HL7 standard. And so how to build around that particular area of data such that ISVs can build against the data model, the data lands in the common data service and in this analytical storage, 
such as the data lake or Power BI, uh, in a well-defined form. And so now BI specialists who had focus on, okay, building out these BI applications can actually build the applications against the particular shape of data um, and then ultimately create opportunities where they can really build BI applications that work across a broader ecosystem. And so this has created some partner opportunities um, right in that area where you have now ISVs that were specialized into particular areas of these industries, much in be, being able to much better partner with BI specialists in that same area. And so if we take now the sales insights example here um, and we focus on, right, you see things such as opportunities, right, and, and of open revenue, open opportunities, opportunities created by right, different stages of opportunities. These are all well-defined concepts in the common data model. There's an entity defined, there's certain attributes defined, they have very strong semantics that can also be not just like, interpreted by humans of re looking at the data model and trying to understand, okay, this is the meaning of this attribute, but there's also programmatically understandable uh, metadata that helps building those kind of applications. And so now, if you, if you look at right, Sales Insights, works over Dynamics data out of the box, um, right? And so that would not be a surprise, but the Sales Insights application is really built in a way where underneath it works against the particular shapes of data, right? accounts and so on. And so now what one could do is, right, if you think of if you were to build a similar application yourself, how would you build this um, with Power BI? And so here I'm in Power BI and I'm in the, my Power BI workspace and I have already created two data flows here that I've connected to, um, I guess, my common data service where I brought in um, a certain set of dynamics data um, into, right, into my, ultimately, my data lake underneath. But I want to do the same thing, right, and the Sales Insights app can, can operate over the data. What I would like to do is, I would like to be able to build a BI application that works not just over Dynamics data, in this case, but also works over um, additional data from other sources, as long as I shape that data in that same common data model form, the BI application can ultimately bind to that data and work against that data. And so what you see here is in Power BI data flows, there's a certain list of sources right, that you can connect to um, this is very much the same experience that you may be familiar with from Excel. If you use Excel 2016 and you use the get data experience, or if you use Power BI Desktop, where you basically connect to different sources and you can visually transform your data without any code. Um, so that is right, this functionality here. What is new at the bottom here is the section of templates. And for these templates, you see there's already a certain set of templates pre-populated. And the idea behind the templates is, how can we make certain steps simpler, um, right? And so, as, a, as I said earlier, um, there's, there's the new experience in, basically, as part of the common data service, where you can configure to just automatically land the data of the common data service into your data lake storage location. Now, there's also templates here that you see that are specifically scenario-oriented, that are about, let's say, lead to cash, or that I bought right, a certain part of your business process and how to bring that data together with just a few clicks. But in addition, um, there's also a template here about Salesforce data. And so let's click at the Salesforce data, uh, template and ultimately sign in. And just give me a second to sign in here. And so what the Salesforce template does is it basically connects to the particular Salesforce account. And Salesforce has a certain internal data model that is different from the common data model. But what we do in this template is we basically have predefined a list of ultimately objects here that are basically connecting to the Salesforce underlying data and reshaping that data so that it looks like the common data model account entity, the common data model contact, the lead, the opportunity, product, and so on. Right, and in this case, this is all prepackaged. Now, what you also see here is that right, each of those basically prepackaged transforms, you, this is just Power Query. 
as you may already be familiar with it, right? So all the steps that are being applied here, you can actually, right, look at them. You can also, you may have customized your Salesforce deployment. So in that case, you can ultimately, right, just build on top of this template, further extend it or modify it. Now the important step in this template is that this is actually mapping, right? So it does certain data transforms, but then it's mapping to particular standard entities. Right, in this particular case, actually let me show this from here. So it maps to the account entity, this first particular query result. And um, there's only, right, in the template we haven't like mapped out the hundreds of fields that exist um, on the account entity. We focused on what are the most important ones that ultimately would also power experiences such as that sales insights application that you saw earlier. And so, the template also basically predefines these mappings. So as a, as a customer, I could just go ahead, right, take the template, sign in with my Salesforce account. I don't have to do anything further. I just basically say save and close. As part of this process, it will validate against your particular Salesforce instance, which you may have customized, that okay, everything that this template covers is actually working correctly. So that takes a few seconds to ultimately validate and then with that, we have created a data flow. Um, this data flow, and let me just name this Ambas um, Salesforce demo. And so I basically save this definition of the data flow into my workspace. I also get to see right here's the list of entities that this data flow produces. Um, and if I go back then to ultimately at my workspace view, right? So I have ultimately here the set of the previous uh, data flows where I have, okay, Dynamics data represented as well as now I have the Salesforce data represented. And I'll kick off, right, basically uh, pulling the latest snapshot of that data. In the meantime, right, if I go here, this is Power BI Desktop. And in Power BI Desktop, I may be, right, a, a BI analyst. I want to do some analytics over that data. Maybe I want to build such an insights application right, for myself. What I can do is, there is, right, under Power BI, there's a Power BI Data Flows connector. And with this Power BI Data Flows connector, it ultimately, right, connects to all the workspaces that I have access to in Power BI. So you will see I have quite a few workspaces here. The one that I'm focusing on is the demo workspace. And so what you see here is that in the demo workspace, I have these three particular um, data flows that I've created. The third one, right, I just did live a moment ago. And when I look at the content of the data flows, so if you look at the, basically, this particular Salesforce one, I see, I basically have data representing these particular eight common data model entities. If I look at the one that I created earlier out of Dynamics, let me just see if I can bring this all on a single screen. I basically created the same eight entities. Pulled them out of Dynamics, I pulled them out of Salesforce. Now I can build a BI application that ultimately is bound to the shape of the data. Um, and in this case, right, it's the same shape of data, account, leads, opportunities, and so on. And I can build, right, build up my business logic in a single way, operating over that data. And I can decouple my BI insights application development from the, okay, how do I connect to different sources? How do I reshape the data right, and make it look like a certain standard form? In this case, right, we, we picked, okay, common data model standard objects. But of course, you can define your own, right, particular uh, standard objects that you have, right, that you feel are important for your business. Um, and ultimately then have data represented in the single shape and drive, right, multiple B, BI applications from that. So this is another example of where the common data model is in action, um, right, of how it's used across common data service and Power BI uh, data flows to build analytics. Now the sales insights application that I showed a few minutes ago is really a packaged up uh, SaaS application. So that one is just, all you need to do is you, you sign up for it, right, and within basically a minute, you get insights over your own data. So, so it's kind of pre-packaged insights, but the principle is the same here, right, of how such an insight application, you can build it yourself. Now in terms of, right, a brief recap, and there's multiple sessions, right, at this conference today where you can learn a lot more about Power BI data flows, 
and how right, it can help you uh, build out more sophisticated data pipelines, but still in a way where you do this with no code or with low code, right? Something where otherwise you might actually have to bring in a data engineer, right? And so how can you do those things as a business analyst? Um, and so CDM and data flows, it's really about how can I connect to lots of different types of data? And then as part of my shaping of the data, I can optionally also decide to map the data that I have right, connected to and have transformed to particular standard objects. Um, as part of this, the mapping experience that you saw is, is I would say, is, a, is an initial stage of the mapping experience. There's actually an improvements we have on the way of how we'll make this mapping smarter, of how it tries to actually infer more about, okay, what entities the particular data that you have might be, um, I guess, looking similar to. And so you will see improvements in that basically mapping experience uh, very soon as we kind of iterate on that. Um, what's it leveraging underneath is Power Query Online, which is a cloud service experience that is embedded, you saw it embedded in Power BI, right? This was all done in the browser um, in terms of connecting to data, transforming data, mapping data. Um, Power Query Online is also embedded within the common data service. And so if I just quickly show this, if I go back here, right, here was my list of entities. There's this get data button up here. And so with this get data button, what I can do is, when I launch it, ultimately it brings up the same Power Query online experience um, that right, ultimately gives you the same way of how you can connect to data and including hyper-connectivity via the data gateway to your on-prem sources. And so I can write, pick particular sources of data. Now in this case, if I right, connect to some external source, what it does automatically is it will load it into your common data service. So in this case, it would load it into either as an existing entity, so you can load external data, map it to existing entities in your common data service, and right, have that loading of data operationalized uh, based on the schedule and you can decide do you want to rewrite the data each time you execute it, do you want to append and so on, or you can just load it as brand new entities, right? So because you may have just some external data that you need to bring from another um, operational system, let's say, or from another analytical system, you want to bring that data um, as signal into your common data service so that you can ultimately drive and automate certain business processes that you have already built on top of the common data service, maybe with Power Apps, maybe with Flow, which is right ultimate workflow engine, um, and bring that signal of data right into your common data service and then have just these business processes operate on top of that. So it's basically the same Power Query Online experience that is available um, across these services, common data service as well as Power BI data flows. Um, we talked about the mapping, so you saw examples right, where I mapped two particular standard entities, and there's also out-of-box templates um, that we offer. Now, today, there's right, a certain list of out-of-box templates. We are planning to expand that list. We are ultimately also, of course, recognizing that um, some of the templates that we provide, they will right, only address a certain part of scenarios that, you may, right, that may be important to your business. And so what we are doing is we're also working towards how can we enable those templates uh, to be extended by ISVs and by right, even yourself as customers in your organization. If you want to collaborate within your organization with other users, right, defining templates, making them available, iterating on them, extending them to the needs of your organization. So these are things that are, right, we are looking at at the roadmap, we're certainly looking at also feedback on prioritizing right, which, which scenarios we should go after there. So then finally, um, we want to also bring it back to, right, we covered common data model and the common data service. We looked at right, packaged applications, we looked at Power BI, Power BI data flows, how to use it. So finally, I would like to bring back Oleg who will talk through additional scenarios. So we bring him Oleg back here. Yeah. Interesting so far? Great quick connection between the first part and the second part. In the first part, I talk about bringing t CDM to help with heterogeneous data. How would different parts of your ecosystem, how different apps would understand the data if it's expressed in a common format? 
You've seen Robert do the great job of showing you how can you do that actually when the Salesforce and CDS define differently, independently, et cetera. But if semantically it's the same data, it will be understood and interpreted as the same data. Great? Where is enthusiasm? <laughs> Where else would you see that? Yay! <laughs> yeah, I have to make sure that you're like alert. Okay, now what we want to show here is that now you've seen that uh, a part work. Now you've seen that data flows being able to bring you the data into the data lake. We also said that with advances on machine learning and uh, the artificial intelligence, you can further process that data to derive more insights and do actually a better job on analytical. How to do that? So <clears throat> when you, basically you've seen the Power BI bringing data into the data lake. That's the part that you've seen when Robert said that I created a flow and it uh, puts the data into the CDM shape format into the data lake. So now it's not only data, but it has a company semantical definition that help understand the data. But it lands in the data lake. Data lake can do lots of interesting things. Specifically, it can process data using Databricks. But once it processes the data and does the analysis, what would it do with it? It will also write that data out in the CDM format. So again, you're preserving the semantics. So semantics are being lost along the way when you go from left to right, loading data and processing data. And once you do that, you will bring it into the Power BI, an enriched data set that has enriched and, uh, rich semantics in processing based on whatever logic you decide to put into the Databricks or artificial intelligence or machine learning. It's just an example of Databricks that's just limited to Databricks. Just give you the quick recap of what do you do. You first, you select your entities that you'd like to output into the data lake for further processing and enrichment. That's the part that you've seen. This is the list of an entities that you select. Say, I want these entities to be brought into the data lake for further processing. That's where they reside. That's what it physically looks at. And I encourage you to attend a next session that is at 2.15 that will look into the details on how actually it's done with a live demo and a great explanation of all the moving parts involved. Then, to process data using Databricks. This is an algorithm that your data scientist, collaboration, remember the collaboration, we said now we enable collaboration between different parts of your organization. So there is a data engineer and data steward that knows the data well. There is a data scientist that can reason over that data. And now they can share same semantics across. They don't need to sit in a big room and figure out, parse through emails and figure out what's what. Once you do that, it emits the entities now created and reached data into the data lake as well. These are two, so you, you see the, on this uh, uh, left-hand side when it's two different uh, storage accounts that it stores the, the data in. So that was for the Power BI to push the data into the lake. This is the result of the data lake processing. In here, you see another data flow. It's marked external. That's the data flow created by the data, uh, the, the, the data created by the Databricks. Once you do that, now you can use Power BI over newly enriched data set. So now you can see the breadth that the, one of the key takeaways from our session what uh, would like you to take is that there is a breadth of applicability of CDM. So it allows you not only implement multiple scenarios, but it works within the ecosystem that allows you to process data, enrich data, analyze it, get it involved into your CDS-based application so you can have powerful insights app work out of the box because the definitions didn't change. If you like, look at it, we did not change the definition. We had this, the same entity shapes that been processed over using different components and now your apps and your analytical dashboards and everything else looks at the same thing. Remember that great thing that I've shown you in the middle where the silos came into the one box and now all the shapes are interconnected? This is basically illustrates that point. 
Love it? There's more to come. Yes, there is more. So let's look at the broader ecosystem here. Um, and so right, what we have covered this part of the session, we basically said there's Dynamics 365, the common data service as this managed data and business logic platform underneath. Um, and there's experiences of how you can bring all the data that is in your dynamic system um, into the data lake. And including the part about where we can automatically push these data updates on a continuous basis, completely operationalized into your data lake. Now the way we describe that result, we call it a CDM folder. There's public documentation for it. The idea is that we're not just bringing raw data files, but we're actually bringing semantics with the data. And so when you then use Power BI to connect to that data, Power BI can actually recognize right, some of the semantics of that data, um, as well as you can build insights applications that right, bind and look for some of these specific uh, data objects and these data shapes. But there's more here, right? So these were all things that we can do with no code or with low code, right? Even the operationalization, there was no code involved, right? You just configured what entities you want in your lake and it all just works from there. And so there's a broader ecosystem here that we are working with ultimately across Microsoft as well as external partners. Um, so if I talk for it right one by one, if we start on the right hand side of the picture, um, you saw there's right, this example with you could use Databricks, which is really Spark right, processing to do right, more like high scale distributed processing over data plus right, further enrich it with additional data the result of this will be represented again as a CDM folder which tools like Power BI can recognize. But you also see there's additional services in there which is about Azure Data Factory of how do you ultimately uh, ingest additional data, how do you write prep additional data. There is Azure Machine Learning of how you can please simply point Azure Machine Learning to such a CDM folder and it auto generates the pandas data frames for you. That may be a small thing, but it's still right, tedious work that you don't want your data scientists to right, spend their, I guess, scarce time that they have on more right, technical kind of mundane things of just going through right, and creating data frames. Um, based on the CDM folder metadata that is captured automatically, um, it helps facilitate those experiences in Azure Machine Learning. Um, there's also Azure SQL Data Warehouse of how it helps you build up those loading pipelines and build up your data warehouse off of that data and it recognizes relationships, for example, that exist in the data to help you with how you should stage, right, as you load that data into the data warehouse. Um, there's work we're doing with, with Azure IoT of how can you, right, plug in IoT sensors and not just get a raw data stream out of IoT sensors, but actually get richer metadata that helps you be more effective in consuming and analyzing that data. Um, there's also, when it comes to Office 365, right, you have communication data. You have, you have data that you, right, the organization, if you adopt Office 365, you have emails, meetings, phone calls, all those things, right, that the organization does with external customers or partners. Um, there's often very interesting patterns, right, and insights you could derive, right, from some of those email communications. Now, we are working towards right, making sure that with Graph Data Connect today, you can get that data in the graph JSON form. Um, that graph JSON form definitely right, is, is, I guess, well-defined in terms of documented publicly as the graph API structure, but it's highly hierarchical, which makes it more difficult to process with no code, uh, ultimately in Power BI or in other services. So we're working towards um, ultimately releasing updates soon such that you will also be able to simply say, I want to get my, all my organizations or right, certain security groups, and of course there's tenant approval and all those mechanisms, but right, when it's approved by the organization, you want to do large scale data processing and, and machine learning over that data, and we basically represent the data out of office in a CDM folder, where there's certain additional semantics that comes with it that all this tooling ecosystem automatically understands. And then there's also ISV partners we're working with um, that ultimately also participate in this ecosystem in terms of reading and understanding CDM folders and metadata, as well as when they write or process data, that they also write out um, ultimately the data, not just as raw data files, but with additional metadata information. And so specifically around Informatica, um, at the Informatica World Conference a few weeks ago, um, the Informatica released the availability of 
the intelligent cloud services that now also understands common data model. And that includes, right, the connectivities that Informatica provides, mapping the standard entities, and landing that data in a data lake, not just as raw data, but as a CDM folder. And that CDM folder gets registered into your Power BI workspace, optionally, and at that point, it is indistinguishable, right, of how this was created. It just looks like any other CDM folder, right, a CDM folder that maybe was created for, by the common data service pushing data directly into your lake, or Informatica bringing data into your lake, or data breaks or machine learning, processing data, enriching data, and bringing it back into your lake. Power BI will just, right, effortlessly and seamlessly work over all that data. And so, with that, we promised that we would basically try to keep you kind of, um, I guess give you enough time to switch sessions. So we have about 10 minutes left. We will do a quick Q&A. Uh, but in terms of call to action, um, things for you, right, for takeaways, you can learn more about Power BI data flows. There's links there. Um, also about the CDM and its metadata language. Um, there's also the, the spectrum we showed around Power BI, Azure data services, and interop across. Uh, one option is you can follow us along into another room right over there. In 15 minutes, we have a deep dive session where we'll cover more details on that aspect. Or you can also follow, we have a public tutorial available where you can just follow with your own data step by step along the way of how you ultimately connect to right, your data, bring it into the data lake, assisted by um, additional experiences we've built into Power BI with data flows and additional libraries that we made available for Databricks, for Azure Data Factory, for Azure Machine Learning, for Azure SQL Data Warehouse, and how you can build up step by step, bringing the data, enriching the data, building up a data warehouse, and how certain steps along the way that today would basically be lots and lots of work, right, across many different personas in your organization, where you have data analysts, you have data engineers, you have data scientists, that all would need to collaborate and basically talk to each other to figure out how to make this whole thing work end to end, the tutorial shows you, okay, how some of these steps are simplified. And what you will see over the next month is that those, that tutorial will get shorter and shorter because with some of the experiences that we're building directly into those different services, we actually will do more and more of these things automatically, not just auto create data frames in Spark and in Databricks and, and create Pandas data frames in Azure Machine Learning, but there's more and more of these steps that we will basically automatically be able to do based on the metadata that we have represented in the CDM folders. And so with that, um, we will open up for Q&A. I think there's microphones in the room. And, and here's just a list of additional sessions. The one that is yellow highlighted is right, the session that you just attended. Um, there's related sessions listed here with time frames um, on right, deep dive on some of the CDM aspects, deeper dive on Azure Data Services and Power BI and how this all inter interacts, um, as well as on the CDM and the industry accelerators. So there's a broader range of sessions. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the session. and. As I said, we're opening up for a few questions on the Q&A. I see a gentleman over there. Hi. So, um, hello, hello. You can hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Looks like we have trouble with the microphone. I, I don't know if this works. It works? Okay. Um, we, so my question can... was, uh, for 365 um, sales, for example, it is already using, it is no longer having a traditional database behind it. It is CDS? Yes. So the question was, Dynamics 365 for sales, is it built on top of CDS, the common data service? The answer is yes. Correct. And um, sales, customer service, and I think project service is going to come soon. Yes. So, and then the second question was, so when we are connecting to those, we don't have to worry about um, transforming the data because those entities... Yes, so the question was if you connect to right, these areas of sales, customer service, field service, marketing, uh, project automation services, all those applications of the Dynamics 365 suite today are built on top of the common data service, represented its data in the common data model form, and so you don't need to worry about any kind of transforms. The, the example that I brought about the prepackaged one was about how, how you could think about external data and how you bring it into the shape of the common data model. Um, and thereby you have right, pre-packaged BI applications or your own BI applications be able to work against multiple different, ultimately, systems. 
Yep, we have a question. Uh, do you get your answer? Yeah. We have a question on the other side. Please. I'm interested in your CDM to the data lake uh, you know, replication. We're currently users of the data exchange service in CE where we're creating copies of our, of our CRM system in, in Azure. Is this gonna perform in a similar way? Is it gonna be near real time or is it um, a little slower kind of replication? Sorry, I think it was very difficult to understand. I think so I was trying there was, to read. Yeah. I guess we, we can, I guess I'll just walk up and we'll repeat the question. Somehow I the was microphone. trying to read what is there, but it's got yes. a hard. Okay, so we're currently um, using data exchange services for customer experience to bring okay. our CRM data into an Azure um, MySQL database. Yes. So a CDM to the data lake, will it have the same kind of performance characteristics? Will it be near real time? Or is it okay. gonna be laggy? Okay. What, what, what are the plans for that? And when would you plan to migrate from what we're using today with data exchange service mm -hmm. to this new CDM approach? Okay, so, so the question was, right, you, you are using today, uh, you call it data exchange service, we, we call it data export data service, export kind service. of DES. Yeah, DES. Um, and so that is a way of how you can bring common data service data at scale into right, your particular storage into a database and so on. Um, ultimately think of what I briefly showed here today and I'll show in more detail in the next session. Um, and there's other sessions where we go into full detail of this. Think of it as it will ultimately replace what you can do with the data export service today and it will also basically be a push approach of continuously pushing those updates. Um, I think you also had a question of, okay, is it gonna be near real time? So this is where uh, we ultimately will also enable uh, an experience that will go to near real time. I think to start with, right, we will basically start from something more conservative, but think of it, right, something that is less than 45 minutes or so of delay. Now in practice, you will see the delay is much, much shorter. Um, so in the minutes, uh, but we will also we also considering of should we make it configurable out of the box you get a certain SLA around how much latency there is and then should there be certain areas of entities that are more sensitive to real time where we should give you options of okay for those we will make sure we, we basically give you faster updates so those are areas that we are exploring but the idea is that out of the box you will get a certain minimum time latency or data freshness SLA and then uh, we may give you more advanced options over time of how you can further fine tune to the needs of your organization. Thank but you. ultimately it's, it will work at scale um, at right, what the data export service does today, just that one has more complexity of setting it up. Yep. So we're gonna take one more question and we're gonna wrap up. Uh, Mike, Mike, Mike. Go ahead. So my question is about um, custom. If I wanted to make a CDM and it's, I have an on-prem SQL database, is that possible, or do I can I only connect to um, to cloud premise? I mean, cloud servers. So the question is, I think, uh, can I define a CDM that actually uh, reflects the data in a SQL server? Yes. Yes, you can define a CDM entity pretty much any shape you like. There is a convenience of using standard entity definitions that we published, but mm -hmm. you're not limited by it. Okay, perfect. So you can use them and extend them, for example, if you look at our account and you see a few attributes that we haven't thought about, you can use that as a, uh, a blueprint and extend them, add extra attributes, for example. Ah, uh, sweet. Or decorate them, yeah. So it's a starting point. I, I figured that your question is, am I limited to it? No, you're not. You can use it as a starting point. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I think maybe if it's a quick question. We yeah, it is very quick. That yeah. was quick, so I was. So uh, it seems like the master of the CDM schema is still in Power Apps. You would go to the web Power Apps portal and you can view the, the, the schema and you get one CDM per environment. So when you're talking about data lake and mapping to a CDM folder, how do you specify the environment? Is that default to the tenant? Oh, okay, so, so on that one, um, I didn't, I only showed f a few of the screenshots. In the next session, I will show you more detail. You basically make this operation from a, within a given CDS environment. And so you basically say, I want this CDS environment to map to this particular okay. data lake so location. So you can specify it. Yeah. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Great, Thank guys. you, everyone. See you on the next session. Yay. Thank you.